I'm seeing it more and more now that when I go to pay for something, particularly online, I have the option to pay with a bank transfer, which, of course, behind the scenes is enabled through open banking. But despite the fact that BST2 was introduced way back in 2019, these types of transactions are still a tiny fraction of, of total payment volumes. Will it grow? Are we going to see other innovations driven by open banking? What more radical disruptions could it bring? That's what we're going to find out in this episode of Navigating Digital Payments. Welcome to the Navigating Digital Payments podcast, brought to you by Worldline, bringing you the latest innovations, trends and predictions about the future of payments. Hello and welcome to this episode of Navigating Digital Payments. I'm David Daly. I look after the Discovery Hub here at Worldline. And today I'm really thrilled to be joined by a fantastic guest, a real expert in all things related to financial services and payments. We've got Dr. Michael Salmoni with us. He is an internationally recognised leader on strategy of business innovations in digital and financial services. And he has a particular focus on payments, open finance, fintech, digital identity, electronic money and CBDCs. Michael, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you, David, for that far too kind introduction. I hope I can do justice to at least 10% of that. Uh, Very glad to be with you. I set the bar high, Michael. (laughs) Right. So, um, So in a moment, we're going to look ahead to where open banking might go in the future. And, And at the end of the podcast, I'd really like to get your thoughts on what sort of more radical changes or disruptions we might see in five to 10 years time. But before we come on to that, I thought it'd be really good to understand how we've got to where we are today. Um, so maybe you could begin, Michael, by setting out in in simple, kind of easy to understand terms, what we mean when we talk about open banking. Well, for me, open banking is the jump from the Nokia to the smartphone. Uh, we saw that in the telco industry, that in the past, the Nokia kind of uh, uh, phones, you only got the functions that Nokia programmed in, and that was it. And uh, by opening up and allowing third-party app developers to put things on top of your phone, you've completely unleashed the creativity of the, the third market, and that's why the iPhone is so much more valuable, because suddenly uh, uh, you get Candy Crush and Tinder and Deliveroo and a million other things happening. And this is only possible because a standard interface was put on the phone and allowed third parties to develop new clever things on top of it. And that's why we have this revolution in telcos. And this is what's happening now in all industries, especially in banking. Previously, you only got from your bank what the bank programmed into your mobile banking app or into your online banking. And in future, you will also get third parties developing new clever things on top of your bank. And we're going to have a similar evolution there. It reminds me that when smartphones were first coming on the scene, a a not atypical reaction of an average consumer might have been, well, I just want a phone that that makes phone calls. (laughs) Why, Why would I want anything else from a phone? And yet... I would argue now, I would not buy a phone that was not a smartphone anymore. I mean, my uh, there's there's no going back once you've um, once you've opened that particular box. I mean, do you think where are we at with open banking at the moment? Are, are people still thinking of it in that way of well, why why do we need this, or or are they starting to think actually I I wouldn't want it any other way? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's it's very hard to imagine what this revolution will bring, and and, and even you know when the phones were opened, everybody thought it would be all about telcos, you know, that you could manage your SIM contract better and your your mobile minutes, you know, everybody was thinking only about telco. But of course, on your phone, one of the things you do the least now is actually make phone calls. So it's become so useful in all these areas. And it's equally hard to imagine what this will mean for banking. You know, everybody's thinking about financial services. I think it's going to be used for a, a million other sort of topics, which we haven't even begun to think about. So that is surely one of the uh, issues we have to cross, right? But there are thousands of fintechs out there coming up with clever ideas. That's not a problem. Um, But it is harder to do. That is maybe the more serious point. You know, Apple can just say, I'm opening up my iPhones and these are the APIs and you all go and program to it. 
Whereas banking, there are 4,000 banks in Europe and, I don't know, 10,000, 20,000 banks in the world. And to get them opening up in a sort of common way with common standards and common rules, that is a bit more difficult. That's why this is taking a bit longer than some people anticipated. And I mentioned briefly in the intro PSD2, and I think it's fair to say that has a strong relationship to open banking. Can you, again, for people who are not so familiar with it, can you just explain what the significance is of PSD2 for open banking? Well, PSD2 is the thing that really kick-started this whole development, and it came out of Europe, if you can believe it. You know, usually we think everything comes out of California or out of China. This is actually something where the European regulator said, I'm not happy with the innovation in banking, with the competition, with the fees. I want more customer orientation. And one of the remedies they thought of, there were only two paragraphs in, in the PSD2 proposals that said, let's open up the data and let's open up payments. And this is what's causing this revolution. So PSD2 is the law that was passed in Europe, which is now, by the way, being adopted around the world, which is opening up banking. We had a, a previous episode, actually, where we talked about regulations and the impact on innovation, because I think it's it's not atypical for people to think to imagine that regulation stifles innovation, it prevents innovation. But we talked about how actually there are some regulations that indirectly stimulate innovation by increasing competition, for example, but some that very directly stimulate innovation. And I guess PSD2 is an example of that, where it's actually creating or helping to create an ecosystem where these banking services can be accessed, as you said, in a, in a fairly standardised way. What was the reaction of the industry and maybe you, you can segment that a little bit in in terms of perhaps the what was the reaction of the traditional the incumbents the big banks but also the reactions of maybe the the fintechs and and the the startups in in the the financial ecosystem yeah there are two two things in there i mean what one is uh, uh yes it was the regulator who who kick-started this and that can be surprising for some some people say maybe the innovation department of the banks has now moved to brussels that's where all the big impetuses are coming from now <laughs> uh, um and that to defend the banks let's say uh, is because it's a network industry and it's very hard to move a network industry. You can get some people to move, but you will never get everybody to move unless somebody like a regulator comes in and let's say, please do, let's please do SEPA. Let's all do a harmonized way of doing payments in Europe. Let's please do instant. Uh, let's do, please do PSD2 because no, no way will, will 4,000 banks agree on this by themselves. So sometimes a, an impulse from a regulator is just necessary. That's why some innovations have been created by, by the regulator, which uh, in this complex multi-sided industry would not have happened by itself. So that, that, that's, that's the first part. The second part you, you asked about was the sort of reactions by the industry. And as always, not everybody was pleased. Um, some people saw it as a fantastic opportunity. In fact, some have been doing open banking uh, 20 years before PSD2. Uh, the Germans, for example, uh, in Spain, a few others. They're in America, they, they'd been doing something like open banking on an industry initiative by themselves. And they, of course, thought that this was great, right? This is now something that is going to be a mainstream uh, development. And uh, some, of course, hated it because they thought, oh, God, I'm going to have to change my ways and open up. And this is not what I'm used to. And, of course, but quite justifiably, they said, I am going to have to open up my data, my crown jewels to competitors and to others and for free. Uh, this is kind of scary. But uh, we see a more and more uh, the dominant effect that the smart banks, which is the majority, th thankfully, are seeing this as a major opportunity and happy to talk about some of the opportunities for banks in this space. And I was going to say, what was the reaction of, say, the smaller companies, the startups, the fintechs uh, to, to this kind of regulation? I mean, the smaller companies, of course, thought this was brilliant, right? This is like the app developers on the iPhone to bring it back to our original thing. You know, they think this is a fantastic opportunity. If I come up with a new clever service like Uber or Tinder or Candy Crush, I can sell it on, on billions of iPhones and, 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 and conquer a huge market. So these fintechs, for, for them, it's a complete gold rush. Right? Uh, suddenly they can sit on top of all the banks, access the customers that all the banks have, which is basically everybody, 
use their infrastructure, which is uh, pretty uh, useful, and, and put new services on top of that. So the, the small and the fintechs, uh, they loved it. Um, th but there was some concern amongst the banks initially, because that, of course, is a huge transformation for them. I also mentioned that PSD2 has been around or came into force in 2019. So we've had four years, pretty much. And it still, to me, feels like open banking is in its infancy. It, does, it doesn't feel like it's impacting every every payment I make or every interaction I have, have with a bank. But what are you seeing that banks or fintechs are already doing now that, that's quite interesting or exciting or, or a bit novel? I mean, there's a law in innovation, and I used to work in innovation at IBM with the publishing industry and with the music industry and various others, that it's always uh, takes longer than you think, and B, it is always more disruptive than you think. Those, those two things always happen. And uh, open banking is the same. It takes longer than we all thought, or some thought, and it's going to be more disruptive than anybody can imagine. I, I'm sure that's true. But as for the actual uh, use cases that are coming in, I mean, the UK is, is, is leading the, 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 the way there. Uh, for example, about half the UK banks are now using open banking for their loan business. Because if you grant a loan to somebody and you can see their transaction data and see, oh, this guy, he regularly pays his bills. He's got a Netflix subscription, which he never misses. He, he never gets overdrawn. Uh, then you can make a judgment uh, versus somebody who gambles a lot, always gets his payments refused, uh, doesn't pay his bills, uh, always is overdrawn. Uh, and that is so much better than just getting a red-green traffic light from some credit ra rating agency. So you can make much more informed credit decisions uh, by using transaction data, not only from your own bank, but also from the other accounts the customer may have. So the prediction is that about three quarters of the banks will be using open banking to improve their, their lending business. And that's the core business of the banks. And that's just one tiny example. You know, you can show also how insurances are better and how you can, uh, every single financial services and non-financial services are being in enabled by open, open banking. People are paying their taxes increasingly using open banking uh, in the UK. The, uh, the use cases are just beginning and becoming more and more mainstream in some areas. And, and I realised that, um, in a, again, in a previous episode, we talked a little bit about credit scoring and also, when I last applied for a mortgage, for example, I had to print out and send bank statements, which is A, a hassle, B, doesn't feel particularly safe or, <laughs> or secure. To, um, and, and of course, you're right that open banking would enable that to be done securely and much more easily from a, from a user experience perspective let alone the benefits, as you highlighted, of actually being able to do a better and more accurate um, credit assessment on someone. And and certainly I see it more, I, I've seen some charity donation sites and certainly the UK government for tax payments now accepting um, open banking initiated payments. So it's, uh, I mean, my experience is that where it's implemented, the experience has been quite smooth um, from my perspective. Absolutely. I mean, th this was one of the first use cases that, that was really a no-brainer, right? So there, was this, there was a tiny fintech in Edinburgh, I think, who was one of the first to, to actually create this uh, cast light. They've since been bought up and now part of Credit Kudos, which is, and which is being bought by Apple. And, you know, these are all billion-dollar enterprises by now. And uh, th they do what, what we're just talking about, you know, instead of some paper-based process where you show a printout of your utility bill and your last salary payments and it takes weeks for the, that, you know, that makes no sense. That makes no sense for a bank. That makes no sense for a customer. Uh, the, 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 you can really improve that. And by the way, they are also monitoring the loan if the customer consents while it is running so that they can see that, for example, uh, if you get into any stress, for example, people cancel charity payments. That apparently is a signal that they're getting into financial stress if they stop paying to Greenpeace and to the Red Cross. And that may be then a signal to send to the bank and to the customer, maybe you should have a conversation about refinancing the loan because there's obviously something happening, right? So all these sort of things make the whole loan process, not just the application, but the whole running and refinancing, you can do that so much smarter. But one thing we, 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 we haven't really talked about is the B2B angle. 
that is actually much more significant than the consumer angle. You know, corporate treasury and financing and doing smart invoicing and working capital management and liquidity predictions. That's where the real money is and where the real transformation is happening. And we've talked there quite a bit about, I guess, the financial sector, banks, loans, insurance, fintechs. What about merchants and, and people who are accepting payments? What, what are you seeing as the impacts of open banking and PSD2 for them? Well, merchants love this because, of course, this is an instant payment that is irrevocable, that is immediately on your account, as opposed to a credit card payment, which uh, has all sorts of fees. You need to handle PCI uh, compliance costs. Uh, the money will arrive uh, sometime later. There's a problem that you might have a charge back. So merchants are very keen on this whole account-to-account -account based payment with all these added functions. They're also going into sort of soft pause solutions where you start getting financing at the checkout. So instead of just inserting a dumb card or tapping a card, you get, oh, this you bought a large screen TV. Maybe you actually want to pay this from your savings account and not from your current account, right? Or you may want to finance it in installments. You know, you can do all sorts of other, fu other functions than you can just by, by tapping a card. So mer mer merchants uh, love that, that's for sure. And it's interesting, I think of another use case that we discussed on a previous episode we weren't we weren't talking specifically about open banking but it's this whole topic of budget management this is becoming more and more relevant in the new economic climate we've even seen i think there was a social media trend of people now withdrawing cash and putting cash in envelopes for what they want to spend it on each week or each month but of course all that budget management can be implemented i suppose a bit more in a digital way let's say if you are, if you have more open access to people's bank accounts and can see a fuller picture. We've talked now so far about what's happened to date and what you're seeing happening already. In the kind of shorter to medium term, what do you think are going to be some of the big changes coming in in open banking? Yeah, I mean, this is always the fun part, right? The unexpected consequences, right? So these are all the things that are obviously going to happen, right? They just they just make so much sense. But what are the unexpected consequences? And again, I think, sorry to keep coming back on the, the open uh, phone model, but, you know, uh, we are, again, only talking about financial services at the moment. But uh, this data that is on your bank account, and if you consent to share that, you, you can actually get all sorts of other services happening. Um, for example, there was a hackathon uh, recently, and the winner was a dating site. And the dating site, uh, who have a huge experience in how to get people together, for, uh, and they said if somebody's willing to share a little bit honestly about their real profile and your, and your banking transaction history tells you whether you're really Greenpeace, you don't fly very much, you have a cat, you are not married, you know, there are all sorts of really, you subscribe to these magazines, you know, that's really interesting information. And that can bring people together with like interests, because on these dating sites, people lie all the time, right? And here you can actually have a bank verified photo, and a bank verified age, and a bank verified interests, and brings people together in a much more reliable way. So this dating site actually said they would love to get into open banking. So that's one of the sort of surprising things uh, we will see. And I'm sure that's actually going to be the dominating effect, that bank data will be used for all sorts of things which we can't even imagine yet. As you say, you heard it here first, that uh, open banking will lead to better dates, <laughs> more <laughs> accurately matched dates in the future. <laughs> and um, But I mean, that is an interesting point, isn't it? That banks know their customers because legally they have to. And so I guess that adds some extra value to their data versus, say, a company where, like you say, a, a site where I might register and, and lie all about my income and my profile and my ho hobbies. I mean, it, it has a certain degree of um, reliability, I guess, the data that the bank has about you. And practically then, I guess we're saying banks have data about us. With our consent, this data can be shared. What do you think that is going to mean for the industry? Are there other than broader impacts on, on finance and banking? What we are seeing is that all industries are gradually opening up. You know, it's not only banks and telcos, it's also finance and health and energy or smart meter data. You know, everything is interesting once it gets mashed up. And that's, uh, that, that's how Uber was created. Uber is actually a mashup of four APIs, of four data sources. 
It's your location, the driver's location, the maps, and the payment. Those four are mashed together to provide Uber. If we look how transformative Uber is for the transport industry, and it basically is, at its core, just the mashup of four data sources, I think you can begin to get a sense of what this opening up means when banks and other industries start opening up. So in a moment, then, I want to ask you, Michael, for your predictions about what might be the more radical or futuristic things that we might see in uh, over a longer term sort of time horizon. And I know that's a, a hard question. And I promise I won't come back in 15 years time and uh, and hold you to account for what you say. But before we come on to that, I do just um, want to let people know or remind them that if they want to contact us on the podcast, let us know uh, suggestions for future topics or give us any feedback, then you can reach out to us by emailing ndp-podcast at worldline.com. And of course, my usual reminder to please uh, subscribe to the podcast and, and leave us a rating and a review. So, Michael, the the big question, what do you see as the the biggest disruptions or the biggest changes that we might conceivably see in in, in 10 or 15 years' time? Well, uh, that, that's a bit of an unfair question, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, because n- nobody can look into the future. The boring answer is it's all going to be in B2B. I think uh, we always ignore that. We only think about consumers and what it means for them. And uh, and that, of course, is all fun what uh, uh, and interesting. But the real difference will be in B2B. You know, if you look at corporate treasury, uh, it is an absolute nightmare, uh, especially for SMEs, which are 90% of a, of, a, of a market. It's all done with paper and fax and invoices being copied from one printout into, into another. Uh, this whole scene is so ripe for disruption. And if we use more digital financial services where open banking will also help, this is going to be massively transformative. Uh, I was thinking just the other day how often P2P gradually makes its way into B2C. So, for example, I I notice that more and more if I if if you're paying a trade like a plumber or someone, that's just become a, a a a direct credit transfer now. Probably used to be cash or check. And and that's kind of a shift that I've seen. It used to be I've paid my friends with a, a direct uh, credit transfer, and and now it's very normal to pay a trade. But I also heard that in Belgium, where they've introduced mandatory digital payment acceptance, some shops are just putting a little sign up with their bank details and asking for a a direct bank transfer. So in a kind of a strange kind of sideways way, things move from P to P into. B to C. No, absolutely. I mean, if you if you look around uh, Europe or, or indeed around the world, you know, a number of these P to P systems have been hugely successful. I mean, Swish and Bizum and uh, of course M-Pesa uh, has been around for ages. Uh, th- these are very successful, and and once you have an infrastructure like that, then it's then you can also start paying the pretzel seller on the street, which is sort of P to P, but it's P to small b. And then you start paying at a proper merchant. You know, you pay at Waitrose and you pay at Sainsbury's, so P to big B. And then uh, uh, yeah, there is an evolution and a, and a connection there as people get more and more used to this. And that's, of course, where these fintechs, again, win, right? Because there's, there's going to be one fintech who's super savvy about uh, vending machines and will connect all Coca-Cola machines and and, uh, uh, drinks machines at stations to your bank account so that you can pay just by by looking with your eye into the iris scanner at, at, the, at the Coke machine. You know, so every single niche, some fintech will come along and optimize that so you don't have to get cash out and, uh, and, and do all these ghastly uh, 17th century means of payment anymore. And that's again, comes back to the convenience point, which I think runs through all of this, doesn't it? That as you mentioned about... Um, loan applications, credit assessments, if you can make it A, better in terms of being more accurate, but B, also better in terms of less friction, a smoother experience for the user. So whether that's buying a can of Coke at a station or applying for a mortgage, um, essentially in both cases, you want something that works and is accurate 
and something that is as easy as possible for for the the end user. But it sometimes can be a problem with security because although people always say privacy, security is the thing I'm most interested in, in practice they always go for the convenient option. And if someone offers a convenient option which where they harvest your data or where they they cut corners on security, these guys often win. There are plenty of examples in that, and that's dangerous. So one uh, always needs to bear in mind when following this tendency of consumers to go towards the con- most convenient option that is really done in a safe and a private way. And and again, though, it's an interesting. I'm not sure whether double-edged sword is the right uh, metaphor to use. But so, so one thing we talked about before is is tailoring security more to the individual and the individual transaction. Meaning, if I'm buying from a shop a similar product that I've bought every week you know you probably don't need to put as much security into that transaction as if it's a unusual product that I haven't bought before um in a different location that I don't usually spend at and possibly some of the open banking data can be used to essentially decide whether or not you need an extra level of authorization putting into a transaction I, I would put it slightly differently if I if I may um, um... It used to be a trade-off. It's either secure or convenient, right? Because if you have more clicks, then it's more secure, but it's less convenient. That trade-off is no longer existent. We have plenty of really good technologies like biometrics and you know the hundreds of sensors we all have around us now, which allow you to do super secure solutions while being super convenient. And it's just clever use of data. I mean, uh, I always come home... Uh, and the first thing I do is I take off my jacket and throw my phone on the bed and, uh, uh, you know, have particular patterns. And uh, if the phone detects, ah, it's him, he's in this part of London, it's 6 p.m., he has just thrown his phone on the bed again because the gyro sensor sensor that, then if he now picks up the phone and sends his son some pocket money, that's probably him. I already know that because I've just seen the data. It is he is holding his phone and he sends his son pocket money every so often. This is data you can, you don't need to do a second and third factor authentication. You just use the data. And this is something I think we're going to get more and more into that with the smart use of data is going to make our lives much more convenient and more secure at the same time. Which is a really good point you make there, but it's not an either or, it's actually... It's more convenient and it's more secure um, in parallel. So I think it's been a it's been a really fascinating and quite wide ranging discussion, actually, Michael. So it was great, I think, to to hear from you the the background to the development of open banking and this um, very good analogy, I think, of comparing it to the the rise of the smartphone, um, and also fascinating to hear about some of these use cases. You mentioned credit checking, but I think I've certainly not come across the example of better better matches for dating websites using open banking. So that's that, but it just shows. I, I guess it's it, the main thing there is it, it's actually an example of of just how unexpected the use cases can be once you start to to open things up. And then, of course, your predictions um, for the future. The fact that you see the real value and application of this happening in the B2B space in the future. So, yeah, really, really nice to have you joining the podcast, Michael. Thank you so much uh, for, for being with us for this episode today. Thank you, David. No, it's been a real pleasure. And I hope some of the reasons why I so enjoy working with innovations has come across and payments is everywhere. So one can really play in all all real life situations. And that's that's part of the fun of it. So thank you for the invitation and very good to speak to you. Likewise, Michael, really brilliant to have you uh, as a guest. And that just leaves me finally to thank our dear listeners for joining us again, as we navigated digital payments. Thank you for listening to the Navigating Digital Payments podcast, brought to you by Worldline. Join us next time to learn more about the latest innovations, trends and predictions for the future of payments.